There we are. Sorry about that. Okay. Go ahead. So now you got the recording part at the most controversial piece I'm going to say. I said all the regular stuff before. So I can go, Larry's crazy. He's going to say controversial stuff. That's how he started it. Just for those listening, I didn't start that way. But this part I am controversial on. And that is we start at a disadvantage. So what does that mean? If we play it safe, we lose. And not just that, we get crushed for sure. We may lose anyway. We might get crushed anyway. But if we play it safe, we are going to be crushed and we're going to lose. So roll the dice on a lot of things. The worst that happens is you still get your ass kicked. And it's fine. That's the worst that happened. You're going to get kicked anyway. But if you actually can make some impact, life is good. So roll the dice on things. That doesn't mean go crazy and start screaming and yelling. It doesn't mean that. It means when you're going to err on the side of is this controversial or not, or is it you can often err on the side of a little bit risky. I'm not saying go crazy. Know your audience. That's a critical piece, obviously. Know who you're trying to talk to. But err on the side of a little bit risky because you'd rather be in a place where people are paying attention to paying attention to you than no one paying attention to you. Our death nail was not bad press. Our death nail is uh, death nail is no press. I don't want you to have bad press. So I'm not saying go crazy. What I'm saying is you need to get press. I'd rather have you explaining yourself on local TV than not being on local TV, if that makes any sense. If I have a choice, if my own choice are that, I'll take that one, right? Of course, I'd rather you be on local TV saying cool, awesome stuff. That's always the best. But you want to get people to know who you are. It's an important piece. Why do I say that? I run my campaign, and those who've been on my campaign or have seen me do it, I run it in a very libertarian style. I at first ran my campaign like a business. That was in 2018. That was a mistake. That is a bad idea. Campaigns are not businesses. They're passion projects. That's what they are. They're not businesses. And you should run it like a passion project. And if you're going to be a, a candidate, you are the center of purpose. That's what you are. You want to be the person that's involved around all the time. You want to be there. This, that was the part about the time I brought up earlier. You were the center of purpose. If you act like you better get this thing done, Brandon, and get it done now, Brandon's going to leave. He's not going to stay because you either pay him nothing or you're paying him peanuts. So he's going to pack up and walk away. So I can't do that. What I got to say is, Brandon, come on, brother. It's me and you. Let's get this done. And Brandon's going to be like, you know what, Larry? I'm behind you. Okay, I'll get it done. If Brandon doesn't want to do it, you let him go, but not like a jerk. I don't go, Brandon, you screwed me over. Get the hell out. I don't do that. I go, Brandon, I got it, man. You're too busy. No worry. John, can you, can you step in? That's it. It's a passion project. I'm not firing people. It's not a job. That's not how you have to treat it. It is a passion project. You should be happy when people are with you. It doesn't mean that you let people walk over you. You're just nice about it when you let them go and pick somebody else. Because guess what? Brandon might be mad at me now because he's too busy, but he'll, I'll need him again six months from now or I need him a year from now. We are too small of a group for us to be fighting each other. It makes no sense. So I'm nice to him now. He walks away because he's busy. Six months from now, he's not busy anymore. He comes back in, remembers I wasn't a jerk, and now I have another good worker again. So I want that to happen. It's a passion project. It's a critical piece to understand. Let me, uh, let me keep going when it comes to um, the rolling of the dice. You want to give people as much autonomy as you possibly can. As much as, po as you possibly can. It doesn't mean be crazy. I'm saying err on the side of not being controlling. Not go, Larry, and things will go wrong. Things are going to go wrong anyway. No matter what you do, things are going to go wrong. But I would rather the people have some responsibility for it on their own than you trying to control them and get mad at them. And you might say, Larry, that sounds crazy. I ran a campaign that raised over half a million dollars, went over a year. I had dozens of people on my team. And if anyone on the, on the call were on that team, you know, I hardly ever knew what was going on. I'm not joking. I hardly ever knew what was going on. Why? Because I trusted my lieutenants to get the job done. And we got the best we had ever gotten in New York State, hands on it wasn't even close, because my job was showing up and communicating, right? Even this, I didn't realize when this was happening. I just found out what I was doing literally today. And that's okay, because my job is to show up and communicate. My team does all the other work. You guys see my social media? I'm not even on it. All I do is my lives 
and everything else gets posted by other people. They take care of it all. Is it sometimes bad? Yes. Is it sometimes amazing? Yes. But it's consistent and always out there. And I don't have to worry about it because my job is to communicate and to show up. So that's why I'm talking this way because it's what I do. I'm not just saying this from just Larry's talking from an ivory tower. No, I'm on the front lines with you all. I'm doing the same thing. And that's why I'm saying this. So next piece, talk about the team you have to build. The next thing you have to build, policy. This is one of the hardest things for libertarians to build because we hate government. And we talk to other, other, other people, libertarians, and we feel like policy is government bad. That's true, but not a policy. You have to come up with policies that matter for the people who you're trying to work for, whatever that is. You're running local, wherever you, what, what do they care about? You might, like, I've, I've, I've run for governor of New York State more than once, right? Doing it now, running around doing all this stuff, right? Absolutely. When I'm in New York City, I don't talk about guns. Does it mean I don't support the Second Amendment? Of course I do. Of course I do. Do I talk about it in New York City? No, because they don't care. In New York City, the Second Amendment is the second suggestion. I accept that as true. I hate it, but it's true. So I know that. When I go upstate New York, lots of people care about the Second Amendment. So I speak about the Second Amendment there. And I have policies for the Second Amendment that I talk about there. Now, if someone in New York City asks me about the Second Amendment, I will tell them. I will give them my view and my opinion. But I will never lead with that because they don't care. When it comes to New York City, I spend most of my time talking about, believe it or not, education and crime. Those are the two things they care about more than anything else. So I speak about those issues. And I can't just go, crime bad, um, get government out. That's not a policy. I have to have a policy for police reform. I have to have an idea on how to fix it. And if you express actual policies, you will be amazed on how people will treat you. If you don't express actual policies, people will ignore you. It is absolutely not fair because Democrats, Republicans have no policy. Democrats yell, Republicans bad. Republicans yell, Democrats bad. They have no policy. They have no plan to fix anything. They have it in, in years and they still don't. Well, Larry, why can't we yell libertarian rhetoric? Because the system is set up against us. If we do it, they will ignore us. It is completely unfair. It's totally wrong and 100% true. We have to have answers. They don't. They just point other guy bad. If you spew libertarian rhetoric and that's all you spew, you can do that, but you have to have a policy to back it up. If you just spew libertarian rhetoric, you'll be ignored and pushed to the side. You have, you have to have policies. They don't. And what I keep hearing all the time is people say, Larry, I supported you. I gave you money. I voted for you because when I asked you a question, you gave me an actual answer. Most of the time, the other two will not. They will just go other guy bad. They will always fall down, fall back to culture war. You can't. It's unfair. It's the way. You might go, Larry, I can't spend all my time reading policy. Correct. I don't expect that. The, the bigger you can create your team, the better. You want to create, if you can, a policy team. Now, if you don't have a lot of bodies, sadly, that's your campaign manager. That's how that works. But if you can get more, create a policy team. My policy team had over a dozen people on it, and we met every Monday for two hours, every Monday. That's how I created all my policies. If any of you want to, go to ladderstruff.com. They're still there. Please steal any of them that will work for you. Please, if their policies will work for you, steal them. And you don't have to give me any credit. Take them for your own. They're all now yours. Done. Take it. Don't care. Happy for you to take my policies. Please do so. So if you can create a policy team, do so. You should not be reading all the laws. There are, there are literally, in every state, dozens, if not hundreds, of libertarians who would love to deep dive on policy, read all those laws, and come back and tell you how bad government is. And they're right. And they will happily do it. But now you're able to talk about how the system actually works and what can be done with the current system and what can't be done with the current system and then how we need to change the system. If you just go government bad, people go another libertarian who lives in a the, in the crazy world. But if you go, no, because of how the law is written, you can do X, Y, and Z. An example I'll give you in my state, in my state, not every state is this, in my state, education is a right. In our constitution, education is a right. And the state must pay by our constitution for education 
for grades one through 12. So I can't create a policy for education unless I'm prepared to change the constitution that avoids that. So I found a way to create a policy that privatizes two years of school and changes how we tax and changes how we tax within the constitution. I couldn't do that if I never policy team. And when I tell people this, they're blown away. Oh my God, you found a way of doing it. Yeah, because I have a bunch of small libertarians tell me what's going on and I can then create the policy. So policies will matter. Now let me shift into policies for this. I'm saying something else from policy. You almost always want to focus on single issue voters. That is the best way to bring independence to us. Single issue voters is the best way to bring independence to us. People who are all about the second amendment or all about education or all about uh, um, mandates or all about insert thing here. They're all about the environment. They're all about this thing. If you can find, they're all about criminal justice. They're all about bail reform, whatever the case may be. If you can find single issue voters, create a policy that will blow them away and they will come to you. And it doesn't matter to Democrats or Republicans. There are a lot of single issue voters out there. Go after them. I actually went after people who are not, who wanted family law reform because nobody else would talk about it. I went after people who vape because no one else wanted to support the vaping industry. So I actually went after specific people. Now I'm going after, believe it or not, dairy farmers in New York State. So you should be going after single issue voters. That is the easiest and best way to draw people to you. You want the voter who says, all I care about is my Second Amendment rights. That's it, nothing else. I don't care if you want to shoot babies in the streets. As long as I get my guns, I'm good. That person will support you if no one else is. All I care about is vaping. I own vape shops and I want to make sure I can vape in my state. That person cares only about that. They don't care what your education policy is. Those are the people who, who will uh, easily get you, come to you and vote for you and support you when it comes to independent voters. Not just that. They will give you places to go to talk. This is where you can now go. You can now speak to the vaping industry or the dairy farmer industry or the Second Amendment gun club or whatever the case may be. You can go to those places and talk and talk and focus on that one policy that they care about. It doesn't mean you don't speak about other things, but you focus on that policy they care about. Those people will get behind you. They'll tell their friends. They'll vote for you. And here comes the last piece. They will give you money. The last part about this is you have to have to raise money. If you don't like raising money, if you can't ask people for money, do not run for office. I'm not joking. Sadly, it is one of the most important things you must do. I wish it was not true. I really do. I hate having to do it. But as you know, I raise money all the time. I'm raising money now. I always raise money. I have to. I've raised money for some of you might know I've raised money for your for for your candidates. I've raised money for state affiliates. I raise money all the time. It's what I do. You have to. Why? The system is set up that way. And some of you may not know this story, so I'll tell you. When I ran for office in 2018, I didn't realize how bad it was. I knew money mattered. I didn't know how bad it did. I thought that if I run a real campaign, raise some money, and and the nominee from an official party in my state, that people would cover me. No, 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 that's not true. That was, that was, that was my naivete speaking, uh, thinking. They didn't cover me. So I asked them, why aren't you guys covering me in your newspaper, in your TV show? And they were very forward. You don't buy ads. What? You don't buy ads. It is literally pay to play. Literally pay to play. Now, to see if that's true, later on, we literally raised enough money and we went and, and bought some ads. And lit this was literally pay to play. As soon as the, the check is signed, the sales rep says, great, let me introduce you to our political reporter. It was literally like, here's the check, it comes to the reporter, like that. It's pay to play. Now, Democrats, Republicans buy ads all the time, constantly. So of course they cover them because they're always buying ads. We're not buying ads. So you've got to raise money so you can buy ads. If you buy ads, they'll cover you. You might go, will the ads work? Some will, surely. I mean, a lot of people who actually... A lot of people who actually um, uh, vote still watch TV, right? A lot of the youngsters don't, but a lot of people who vote, most people who vote are over 50. And many people over 50 watch TV. I'm over 50. I watch TV, right? My daughters don't. So, so yes, they also don't vote. So it doesn't really matter, does it? That's my point. So TV ads will work, but also something else. Once the, once the TV ads are happening, now you'll be covered in their nightly news. And that makes you valid. 
That makes you valid. So you do want to be able to make, raise the money for that. Next thing, you also want um, to make money to, to raise money so you can get into polls. You might say, Larry, are we going to sue to get into polls? No, it's irrelevant. We'll sue to get into a uh, debate stage. Nope, irrelevant. Doesn't matter at all. Debate stage and polling. We cover both of these. Polling, I asked them the same thing. Why am I not in the polls? I am a valid candidate. I will be on the ballot. Why am I not in the polls? And they were very forward. You don't buy polls. So I got to buy a poll? Yes. Polls cost $40,000 for one poll from a Gallup or from, uh, you know, um, Ed, Ed Zogby, for, for, any, for any of the big boys. It's $40,000 for a poll. And you can get smaller ones for smaller marketing companies. But the smaller ones for marketing companies are good for you, internal polls. But no one else covers them. They only cover the big boys. So you got to pay for a big boy poll so you can get into the press. That's thousands of dollars. Depends on what you're doing. I was doing a statewide poll. For me, it was 40 grand. It might be more if I was doing a presidential poll or maybe less if you're doing a citywide or a local county poll. But for a statewide poll in New York State, $40,000. I have to raise money. So do you. If you want to be seen as where you have to, but not just that. How are you going to get on the TV shows, on the big podcasts, all those things that matter, right? By raising money. They judge you by your last report. Was your last report, did you raise $5 or $500,000? What'd you raise? I wish it wasn't true, but they literally judge you by the amount of money you raise. So if people raise money, then all of a sudden, you'll see you'll be taken seriously and people will start to give you what you want, which is attention and good attention. So I guess if I could wrap this up, the individual who we want is someone who has time, leadership, and a thick skin. The things we want them to do, raise a team, create policy, raise money. If that's what we're trying to do when it comes to uh, candidates, if we do that well, we'll have better candidates, we'll have better results and something else. People will see we can do this well. We'll also recruit better candidates. We'll get people who really want to be libertarian, but are scared and stay Democrat or stay Republican. They'll come to us. How do I know that? Because I ran in 2018 and get in New York State for the first time and nobody cared. Now that I'm going to be running in 2022, I literally have people calling me now all the time asking me about our party. Now they care because they've seen that we can build. They've seen that we have infrastructure. In my state, New York State, when I first started running, I only had 14 or 15 county affiliates out of 62. Now I have 30. So that means about half of our states, half of our counties in our state have an active county affiliate. They've seen us grow and build. They think, okay, now we have infrastructure. They know I raised half a million dollars last time. They know I'll raise at least twice that this time. They already know that's going to happen. So now in their eyes, I'm valid. If I'm valid in their eyes, they will consider coming to us. They're actually considering endorsing me. This is an important issue for us to have. I hope I uh, didn't go too far. Um, guys, thank you so much. I'll take any questions if you like. We're good. Yeah, please speak up if you got questions, uh, if you got, uh, yeah, anything like that. If you're questioning about how to support a candidate or if you're thinking about running. Uh, hey, Larry, uh, this is Hector, uh, uh, Drews. I really appreciate your, your taking your time to talk to us about uh, about you know this idea of uh, running for office. What mm -hmm. do you tell people in New York State when they say, you know, uh, when they complain about town, uh, what I said about the, you know, city hall, uh, or the opportunities that where should I do? What should, what's the first step I should take to even identify a, 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 an office to run for? So okay, if I'm clear, you're asking a, a, a libertarian wants to run for office, and and I'm, and you're asking me where? what office where? should they run for? Absolutely. Ah, got it. Okay, great. Yes. Okay. Two important things. Number one, what motivates you? That's really important. And that may seem silly, but this is a passion project. If you're not motivated, you're not gonna go through the ups and downs required and you're not gonna motivate a team. So if you're someone who's like, I, I think foreign policy is stupid. I don't really care about that stuff. Don't run for Congress or Senate. Don't run national. You don't care about that stuff. You're not motivated by it. Don't do it. But you know what? I think I'd be cool if I ran against so-and-so. I don't care. What do you care about? If you're like, you know what I love? 
I'm so mad because the local place, this stop sign drives me crazy. That's super local. You care about the stop signs and you care about the roads in your system. Run city council, run assemblyman. That's the key, run that. If you go, no, my state's broken, run state. Number one thing is what are you personally motivated by? What's gonna keep you going? What's gonna get you? When you get hammered and you can't move further and Facebook shadow bans you and, and YouTube puts you in a seven day suspension and you lose your campaign manager because you're having a baby and all that stuff's gonna happen, do you quit or do you keep going? So number one issue is what motivates you? Second thing, how much time do you have? I mentioned time. If you are crazy busy with family and work, don't you dare run for a state. Run for something local that you can do weekends on. If you're like, no, I'm an entrepreneur or I'm out of work or I'm a student or whatever, I got tons of time. I can do it all day long. Go state, go big. Go big if you've got the time to go big. If you don't have the time, don't go big. So number one would be, what do you care about? Number two would be, how much time do you have? That's how I would judge what to run for. I think we got a question in the chat from uh, Mark Rodriguez. Um, you want me to read them? Sure. Um, I got a couple I see. First, Tyler says, Larry, how do you start building a team? As I said, you want three people in your team to begin, but I would go as deep as I could possibly go. You want to literally call people, the people that you know and trust, and say, hey, I'm going to be running for, insert thing here, whatever it is, I'm running for, you know, state senator. You know, I'm tired of my state doing this, and I think if I'm a state senator, I can fix X, Y, and Z. I'm tired of our, you know, whatever, our, our gun laws, or I'm tired of our cannabis laws, or whatever you're, you're tired of. And get someone to say, look, here's what I need. And when you ask someone to run for, uh, to, to help you, it is critically important that you set expectations. And I mean critically important. You tell someone, hey, look, James, I'm gonna ask you to come up with my policy chief. And here's what I need. I'm gonna need you to be able to give me at least five hours a week, man. Two hours with me and three hours with your team. I'm gonna need you to find a team and dig through some stuff. And we're gonna have to find policies on cannabis and Second Amendment and education at the local level. It's going to be challenging, but I think you can do it for five hours. Can you give me five hours every week and promise me that every one time per week, you'll sit down with me and we'll cover this stuff? If Jim goes, well, Larry, I don't know. That's a no. That's a no. Next. If he goes, Larry, I can't wait. Oh, my God, yes. That's a yes. That's a yes. And then keep doing that until you find the right people. Campaign manager, policy team, everyone. What are your expectations? That's the critical piece. And if they tell you, Larry, here's what I can do. I can give you two hours a week. Okay. Does that mean you can do it on a local level? Probably, yeah. If it's a local level, that's probably fine. That's statewide. Uh, he's probably going to be on your team. He's not going to be your lead. He's going to be one of the people in your team who can help out. He's just not, not going to be your lead. That's the most critical piece. Ask people, have expectations. Not just that. As soon as you can, first person to get whenever possible is campaign manager because the manager should also be asking, right? Should also be asking. Hey, Larry. That's how you begin. Uh, Larry, could you give us a, some appreciate, a nuanced appreciation of the various kinds of social media, which ones really deliver and which ones are less important? Yes. Um, YouTube is wonderful when you are doing things like email blasts and things of that sort, because YouTube is universal. So YouTube is great when you're sending things out, you're sending links out to donors, you're sending links out to people. You wanna have something on YouTube because it is universal. However, you're not gonna raise the money on YouTube, you're not gonna have any views on YouTube. YouTube is used to, as a link to send to someone else. Otherwise, YouTube is not very effective at all when it comes to anything else. It's good as a universal link to things. Like, you know, for example, as I mentioned, you have um, uh, a, a very niche, you, a, a very single issue voter issue where people who care about, I'm, I'm making this up, but it's, it's a thing in New York, in New York City. People own ferrets. Ferrets in New York City are actually illegal. Ferrets outside of New York City are legal. So ferret owners in New York City are upset. It is a niche group of people. So if I'm sending out something to that niche group of people, I want to have a YouTube page, page 
with a video about my policy on ferrets in New York City. Wonderful, I have that on YouTube. It's universal. They can send out to their friends. Ferret lovers in California will see it. They'll love it. They'll give me money because they know I love ferrets and on and on and on. So that's good for YouTube. When it comes to getting your, your message out, general rule, two heavy hitters are going to be Twitter or Facebook. Those are the two big ones, Twitter and Facebook. Right now, Twitter more than Facebook because Facebook is shadow banning anything close to libertarianism. It is shadow banning the crap out of everything. Like there's no tomorrow. So while Facebook is good to have stuff up because many voters are on Facebook, percentage of voters, tons of them are on Facebook. The problem is how do you get out there? You have to share, 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 share on Facebook. If you want Facebook to be good, you've got to, you've got to make sure you're putting out lots of photos and videos. Sadly, photos will go further than videos. I wish that was not true, but it is. Photos go better in Facebook. Put photos on Facebook and they'll move them around. Twitter is some of the best stuff for communicating. Twitter is good for reaching out to people. Twitter is good for getting people to reach out to you. Twitter is going to be a critical piece when it comes to that. That's how you will raise money off of Facebook. You will raise eyeballs off of Twitter and you want to have YouTube as a universal link. Those are your three. Now, if you want to go to Instagram, go ahead. I got Instagram. I have TikTok. I have all those things. And it's nice to have, but not critical. I have a large team. I'm very blessed. I have a very large team that can do all my stuff. I have multiple TikToks, Twitters. I'm on Lulz. I'm on MeWe. I'm on all those things. But I have a team that puts all that up. So did I answer your question? Uh, yes, you did. But what do you think of uh, traditional media, uh, radio, and uh, newspapers? Television, I'm assuming, is wildly expensive. Don't even begin to talk about that. But what techniques do you use to get into traditional media, which is going to get you into an older demographic, but the, those, are, those people vote? Yes, I'll give you a couple ways of doing that. When it comes to newspapers, I'll do newspapers, radio, and then TV. Newspapers. Local is everything. You want to go to a place where nobody's going. I live in New York City. It's the, the, the media mecca of our, of, our, of our country. And because of that, no one will ever cover me in this damn city because something's always happening. So I leave and I go to the smallest town I can find. I'm in upstate New York because they have two choices. They can cover the, 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 the cow escaping or Larry Sharp shows up. Well, the cow's going to escape next week too. So let's just cover Larry Sharp. I'm not joking. That's the kind of place I would go to. There are some places in North Country where I got 28% of the vote. Why? Because I showed up. So I go there and those guys will actually show up and they'll write. If you have a local county affiliate, which now I have even more of them, local county affiliates will bug the local people in the, in the local press to come show up. So literally some guy shows up with a piece of paper and he starts writing down some stuff or he has his phone, he clicks record and listens to your speech and he writes and he puts a little thing out there. You might go, does that matter? It does for two reasons. One, local media has been decimated recently. So many local writers actually write for multiple papers. Sometimes the same name, sometimes not. So if it's the same name or not, doesn't matter. You could be in three or four local papers. You might go, Larry, my local paper, like 45 people read it. Yes, but if you read a local paper, you vote. That's a guarantee. If you actually read your local paper, you vote. It might only be 50 people who read it, but that's 50 voters. So they're reading it. That's number one. But number two, Every one of those different papers also has a social media presence. So they have a Facebook page or a, sewing, or a website or something. And now when they put that article on that, you put that into your social media. You do that for each separate one. Now to be forward, the, I don't know, the uh, St. Petersburg Herald might be a tiny paper that only 15 people read, but I don't know that. I just see Larry Gillis got the paper again. Oh my God, that guy's in the paper all the time. And I think he's amazing. I don't know who reads that paper. And then the same article comes out in another paper. You post that to the day after. This guy's, he's making a killing. I should write that guy a check. And all of a sudden now, I start, I start giving you money. So that is how you get in the local paper. Uh, um, when it comes to radio, call the morning shows. The morning shows want people on. Call the morning shows and always focus on whatever is the local issue of their day. If they know that the, 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 the fair's coming to town, 
And we're scared because last year the merry-go-round broke. Talk about insurance for merry-go-rounds or how the government regulations is crushing the merry-go-round industry or whatever the thing is. And say you want to talk about that and they'll have you on. Morning shows are big deals. That's how you get into local radio. Morning show, morning show, morning show. If the guys, the guy who produces the morning show also produces the afternoon show and blah, 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 blah. And if they see you cool on a morning show, that's how you get in the afternoon show or the evening show, whatever the case may be. So morning shows is a way to get into, into radio. TV's a whole lot harder, but you can do it. Best way of getting into TV, believe it or not, is through social media. Get yourself on a um, on on a, whatever is the cool podcast of the day. The P, the podcaster, believe it or not, will know TV people. That's how it always works. So if the podcaster likes you, the podcast can recommend you to a TV show. So get on the get on the podcast to the best of your ability. Go on the podcast that makes sense. The biggest ones you can get on. Niche is always good. I do the most nichiest podcast of them all. I'll do anything, right? It's like, this is a podcast just on people who like flowers. I'm in, let's do it. Talk about flowers today, I'm here. And we're talking about flowers, I don't care. Go on niche podcast, they'll get you on TV. That's the biggest issue. I know it sounds crazy, but it, it does work. If you wanna be on, on news TV, then go on radio shows and newspapers that also have a TV presence. And again, they'll shift you into that. I hope I answered your question now. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Mark Rodriguez asks, would joining a local city or town advisory board be beneficial to networking and seeing how offices work and function in public, especially since they are appointed and you don't need to run? Of course, it's a good idea. The question is, though, you know, that to me feels like someone who could be a, uh, a campaign manager to do that, right? Because they have the connections. Right. Most of those things, as a general rule, you don't get much done and they tend to be very boring. And someone who's an exciting candidate doesn't want to do that. Have you, know, have you noticed I'm on no boards? Right. You don't see me uh, on a board. You don't see me part of any of this stuff. Why? I'm a candidate. Right. I need to be exciting and in front of people and yelling and screaming, hooping and hollering. I got to do that stuff. So I spend much more time doing that. But many people on my team have tons of experience. Right. The candidate doesn't have to do that stuff. The candidate has to be motivating, interesting, exciting. People want to talk to them. People want to hear stuff. People think that running for office is a job interview. It's not. It's not. Nobody cares what your experience is. That's, that's not true. What we're running for office is a popularity contest. Literally. It is a popularity contest. Again, literally. Not kind of. That's what it is. Being popular is what matters. Being smart, secondary. Half the people who are, are, who, are, um, who are elected now are complete morons, airheads. I know I meet them. They're total airheads. They have no idea what they're doing. But they're either in the right place, right time, because this, this game is either a rich person's game or establishment person's game, right? Remember, when I, I ran in 2018, there were five people running for office. I was the only one not getting a government check. Everybody else was. Everyone was establishment but me. That's the norm. That's the norm. So, so I want you to be exciting, interesting, able to raise money. Look, why did Obama win? Why did Trump win? Because they were the most uh, you know, qualified person? No, they were popular. That's why they won. That's the reason why they won. So I really think you want to spend time being popular more than this. However, as, as, a, as a support structure, 100% yes. I'm not a big fan of awesome resume. I don't think it works particularly for us. I can jump in um, just because I don't know how much more time we've got. Uh, I've only got five minutes before I stop my other show. Sorry, guys. All right, cool. No, thank you. Uh, thank you again for making the time. I know other people have already said it. Uh, my name is Dennis Mystical, and I actually did. I, I'm not quite following the rules that have been laid out from the beginning here because I actually filed for the U.S. Senate seat here in Florida. Um, and it's I'd probably against sort of the uh, the grain in terms of having some of at least certainly the the available time. I'm trying to do the best I can with 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 the resources I have, but obviously that's a little bit limiting. So, but I want to turn keep in terms of a question. I guess just really the trade offs because one of the things that drove me besides kind of my own limitations, 
uh, as per employment situation about being able to what I think in terms of restrictions that would affect the ability to file and run for uh, more local offices, um, which is a weird one. I know and I don't want to go in down that rabbit hole. I'm going to give you the answer right now already. Raise money, raise money, raise money. That yeah. is your answer. Raise money, raise money, raise money, raise money. <laughs> money, sadly, I wish this wasn't true, but it just is. Money solves a lot of problems when it comes to uh, when it when it comes to uh, running for office because whatever you lack, you can probably buy. Mm -hmm. So raise money, raise money, raise money. That's a critical thing. I wish it wasn't true, but it just is. I was going to ask though, in terms of what you think is the trade off with um, when we don't have somebody out there. Because part of one of the things that motivated me in terms of this was the fact that back in 2018, we didn't have anybody statewide in, in Florida. And I think that's kind of a missed opportunity, even if we don't necessarily have the ideal and the perfect candidate. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to give you a, a opinion that is very unpopular. I know I am in the minority with this. Better to have nobody there than a bad candidate. Better to have nobody than a weak candidate. Because people always say, but Larry, we want to, we want libertarians out there so that we have, you know, that people see us out there. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. No one even knows what a libertarian is. Nobody cares. I know I call people every day. I'm on the phone four hours a day calling people. I call people all the time. I, I cold call people to raise money. They have, they think Ben Shapiro is a, is a libertarian. They have no idea what was going on. They have no clue, right? So no, um, I don't think it makes any sense at all. I think it's a colossal waste of resources, it's a colossal waste of time, unless you're able to make impact after. Now, some people do, right? So when I ran in 2018, I lost. But right after that, I crossed the state again, taking all of the press that I got to go to local so local people could win. We had 103 local victories in New York State in 2019. Then the state said, whoa, that's, and then took away all about access. So the state took away all about access. There are officially no libertarians in my state at all. We are wiped from the map because of the, of the state. However, I went out afterwards and got more victories. If you do that, that's the right answer. If you just go back home, then you've just thrown a year away. No one's gonna remember who you were. No one remembers who ran. No one's gonna, I, there's no person in New York state except for libertarians who, know, who knows who's run for governor for the past 50 years except me. No one knows. So if we have had nobody running for governor for the past 50 years in New York state, it would have made exactly zero difference. It's simply a, it was a, a waste of time and money and I'm against it. We are very short on resources. We are, we are the Marine Corps. We are not the army. We need small units that are very effective to break through the holes and push through for others to go through. Any massive attack is a class waste of time. If I've, I would rather have 10 good candidates supported by 20 people each than 200 candidates who all do nothing and then next year we just put the money away. Because donor burnout is real. Volunteer burnout is real. Activist burnout is real. The people who came on my team because I busted my rump for, four, for, for the year and a half and then didn't run again until now, they're happy to come back and see me again. I didn't burn them out, right? They know that when they write a check to me, it's going someplace good. You wanna be that person. You wanna be the person when they go, you know what? When David's running, it's killer. I can't wait to get behind that guy. I can't wait to write a check for him because he's going to do some great stuff and I'm behind him, not just, oh, you know, he's on the ballot, so maybe someone might vote for him. I'm not writing a check for that. I'm not going to care. And then when he loses, nobody cares. So I want to make sure that people are doing good stuff. And I know to be forward with many of you, I know I'm in the minority here. Most people disagree with me and I get it. I still feel this way. Uh, this may be too exotic a question, but could you tell us briefly who Saul Alinsky is and what you think of his approach to political organizing? Um, I don't know why we're asking that. I don't uh, don't care. <laughs> okay, I just that, that's I honest. Just, Thank you. Yes, I'll quit. What, the 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 cure all for us is not organizing. That's not the cure all. The cure all for us is only one thing. Candidates that people want to vote for. I would argue that Gary Johnson and Ron Paul have done more for our movement than probably any thinker in the country. That's what brought people to the party. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, let me, that's not true. Not the movement, I'm sorry, to the party. I separate the two. The movement is separate from the party. The, move, uh, the party is part of the movement. The movement can absolutely survive without the party. The party can't survive without the movement. 
But when it comes to the party itself, the political arm of our movement, I would argue Ron Paul and Gary Johnson did more than any other thinker at all. They're the ones who got us going. Maybe also, maybe also Brown, Harry Brown too. Maybe those three. They brought people to our party. Our movement's a different issue. Lots of thinkers bring us bring people to the movement. That's the Bastiats and the Rothbards. They bring people to the movement. I'm talking the policy itself. I'm the the party itself. Very well, step into you. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to have to run. Thank you so much for giving me the time you gave me. I appreciate it. I hope I was helpful. I'm sure some of you are mad at me, don't like what I had to say. But I hope at least you know that I said what I thought was real. I give you my honest opinion. Hopefully it's good enough. Thank you, Larry. Thank you Thank so you much, guys. Larry. All righty. Yep, thanks, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, if you would like to continue the conversation for a little while on your own, feel free to discuss yeah, I actually had a general question about um, data science, for lack of a better term, because um, one of the things uh, for, well, nobody really knows me, but one of my pet peeves is running for national office when we can't even win dog catcher. What I'm looking to put together is some kind of a repeatable process for data gathering. Um, for example, we just talked about something that I have always agreed with, which was swaying the single issue voter. Um, do we have anything in place? Uh, the example I use is Orlando, um, which has interesting metrics around it. But uh, do we have like tallies for how many single issue voters and what their issue even is? Because time is a finite resource um, that, you know, we just got done hearing about resourcing. But is there anything in place currently today? Hey, this is Jim Turney. Uh, I'm and I'm near Orlando, uh, but the answer to your question is um, essentially no. We do need to be a lot more focused on data collection. Uh, in my campaigns here, I do that, and I specifically have a lot of entries or fields in my database where uh, I record single issue interest or in some cases it may be multiple issues i mean if it's a vet and uh, you know they care about gun rights uh, they get two checks uh, one in each field so that way i can track um, and keep track of this the issues that are important to people and we record that when we walk up to someone's house whether uh, if we look at their car and see a bumper sticker see something uh, on their home on the mailbox or of course if they uh, somehow come to our attention uh, with a Facebook post or when we're talking at the door with them. Any, it doesn't matter how the contact was done. So I just give that as an example of how to collect the data, but we need to do a lot more. My data collection is really limited just to my city, of course. And, um, you know, that's something that's important. Uh, campaigns are, uh, large campaigns especially, are very data driven. And so um, if you can help, I'd love to have your help and love to talk more about it. Um, so give me a call, 407-587-6462 or email candidates at lpf.org and give me your contact information and I'll get back to you. Candidates at lpf.org or phone or text 407-587-6462. All right, got it. Uh, Jim, let me uh, let me just follow up with what you just said. In case anybody doesn't isn't aware, uh, Jim Turney is an elected commissioner of Altamont Springs, Florida. There in uh, Osceola County, is that correct, Jim? Uh, in Seminole. Seminole County. Yeah. Uh, in Seminole County, he's also a former uh, chair of the actual Libertarian National Committee, the actual LP. Uh, and you know, so he brings out a lot of experience of of what it takes to uh, to essentially talk find the audience and talk to them the way they uh the, the way they want to be you know talked to uh but to the point of the question about issues we don't we do have to build build out our own voter profiles in other words so we do have to ask questions at the door and record the responses but generally like larry said uh earlier larry is sharp uh you don't go into the new york city talking about second amendment uh, and there is a lot of data that we, we know we know exactly where the, that particular issue is popular and we know where it's not. We can basically make an educated guess. 
Uh, and for example, medical marijuana passed by what, 80% um, in, in the state of Florida. So we know that there are, there are and there are pockets that are more or pockets that are less. So we know that uh, we can generally build voter models on, on that, but it's, it's all guesswork. At the end of the day, uh, multiple campaigns over, over, a certain, over a certain area, identifying the same voter on different issues uh, is um, we, we'll have, to, you know, that's the type of work that we'll have to do to build up uh, data on, on specific people. We can buy some of it, but it still has to be confirmed. Uh, it, and uh, it, so either way, we're, we're in a situation where we're always going to be uh, making the best, decision, best informed decisions with the best information we have available. Yeah, that was kind of what I was going for. Uh, um, on a side note, I think I saw you had posted that question in there about bridging the gap between, um, like you used uh, two-way issues in New York City, but um, that's something I really wish we would have gotten to because I had the same question. But um, yeah, so I, I, like, I'm like, look, I'm just some dumbass IT engineer that can put together a database in something like AWS where everyone can access it. But if it's, if yeah, if we've got someone like Jim Local, I'd love to work just put a project together and build something out so that we can make this sort of a repeatable thing for different people in different areas. Yeah, it's something that would, that would need uh, all those, the, the two different parts. Obviously, you're going to need the, the central infrastructure to, to maintain the data and so that we can really have it where, you know, whether it's Jim in one place or anybody locally that's having the direct interactions to be able to collect the data and then have a central system to feed it in. Um, yeah. Yeah. And definitely yeah. it's something we can host and have out there where it's accessible to everybody else. Um, that would be ideal. That would be uh, a step up. Yeah. Now that I think about it, I would not put it in AWS because I think we all remember what happened to parlor. But you just got to, got to make sure we have a, we have our, we're maintaining backups. Yeah. Separately. Well, we, Dennis, the right now, the answer to that question is, uh, e-canvasser. We still have a deal with them. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be continued into next year. I helped negotiate that a year and a half ago, then COVID happened, so it never has really been used effectively, but e-canvasser is Irish owned, so therefore they're not as subject to uh, the polarization issues that we have around here, um, and so we and we have a very good relationship with them. And um, right now we have super good pricing, even for a statewide campaign. And that's a good place to uh, share data. I really hope, though, and and have been advocating for a few years uh, that we uh, make our city CRM uh, develop that into uh, a module for uh, canvassing and and this kind of data collection to help us target voters where we can dump in everything that the kind of stuff I was talking about before, but also L2 political data, for example. Um, so we do know what issues are important to what voters uh, as best as possible, and we can keep adding to it year after year, and different candidates at different levels can add to it. So that is uh, my dream, but we don't have that yet. So in the meanwhile, other than please encourage everyone you know, especially at the LNC level, uh, to help finance that, put some money aside in, into that every year into development uh, so that we're not beholden to anybody else. And um, eCanvasser, though, is right now. And go to eCanvasser.com and you can see their product. But that's the, that's the best option at the moment. Uh, well, I did ask a few que uh, questions uh, that weren't answered, basically because I wanted to hear uh, Larry Sharp's responses on it. You know, there there is a good rule of thumb to you know plan out two years ahead of time before you run, uh, and there there is uh, this issue of well, what do you you know you're passionate about an issue, but the voters are totally on the other side of the of the issue, so it's really at the end of the day not about you, the candidate. It's about the voter who want who you need who basically needs to like you. It's not about the, even the issue. It's actually about finding the issue that will keep the, the, the voter engaged long enough for them to actually get to know you and like you. So uh, in other words, this issue that we keep talking about in terms of issues, uh, the reason why we're spending so much time talking about it is because it's that important. Uh, a, a, a voter, if you're at the door, will give you what, five se seconds of attention, if you're lucky. Uh, so what is it, the first thing that has to come out to your name is, is some really just pleasant my name is, and you know I'm here to visit you. you know? 
But uh, with that said, two years ahead of time, if, if someone's really interested and in, passionate about making uh, making this change happen, you know, we take we suggest taking time to look at where you want to run. Uh, a local office is the easiest way, uh, easiest places to run because there's not a lot of competition out there at all. Uh, I, I keep saying we have 400 municipalities in the state of Florida. Uh, the only the top 20 percentage a percentile of uh, percentage of those races are even contested. That means every every other race, 80 percent of all the races in Florida aren't even contested. Uh, and I and I'll tell you that most of them uh, are uh, a, a lot of the those uncontested seats are basically manned by people who have been there for over decades and most of them are, are retirees. So they're not even willing to put up a fight if you actually run against them. The question is, uh, do, you, do you have the time, uh, like a two year plan to even think about making yourself available to do, do so? Because uh, you don't necessarily need the funds, but you just need the time. And that's, that the time really is the most important part, like Larry, said, Larry Sharp said. So if you have any questions, please contact uh, the candidates committee of the LPF, uh, candidates at lpf.org. And uh, Jim, if uh, you're, I'm going to share your phone number in, in the chat too. Sure, that's great. Yeah, that um, what um, Hector just said is I certainly endorse that. It's um, uh, really valuable to uh, look for opportunities, and he just nailed it. With the most likely opportunity that that most of us are going to find is to run. Uh, in a seat that has a incumbent that's rusty. Uh, they don't really, you know, they, they've been there and uncontested for a while and they're very vulnerable very often, but get to know the situation. Don't just assume that because they haven't been contested for a couple of election cycles that, that this is gonna be a walk in the park. Uh, sometimes it is, though. I can I know some opportunities. If I could find a libertarian candidate, it'd be a walk in the park. But most of the time, it takes a little more um, effort and planning. But uh, if you look around where you are, you might find that you're in a jurisdiction that at your address that um, has a vulnerable candidate, and that's the kind of opportunity that you're looking for. And I should put an asterisk on this too. Uh, Larry, uh, somebody asked him about serving on citizens boards and um, his answer was very good for people who are running for federal office or statewide office, which he's, of course, that's normally what he's uh, thinking of. And, and of course, most libertarians are probably thinking that way too because libertarians like to run for Congress. Uh, but the... Um, the best chances that you have to win are at the local level, the kind of offices that Hector was talking about. Um, but in those cases, you do have an advantage with your resume showing that you have uh, served in the city or, or county. Um, and that goes a long way in my view um, for those kind of local offices. But Larry was correct that if you're running for Congress, it doesn't really help a whole lot to um, it's not a bad thing, but it's not as much of a help if you're the candidate and you, you really can't go out bragging about how you served on the you know, local planning board um, and you're running for US Congress. Uh, the two obviously uh, are not very well connected, but if you're running for city commission or county commission, then that planning board is very valuable proof that you care about your community, which is what the voters that pay attention really are looking for the people most likely to show up. And I should add one more thought to, uh, again, to what Hector said about uh, looking for opportunities. Um, if you can find a race that is uh, the election day is off year or outside the, the, the first Tuesday in November time period, uh, even on an even year, that's a much better opportunity because one thing libertarians really have problems with uh, still is the voter, um, the voter guide that the Republicans and Democrats put out. They usually don't put out one for these, you know, uh, elections that are in the springtime or like this past November here in 2021. They don't bother, but for they're putting out the voter guide for uh, like next November in 2022 and certainly in 2024 and in the general election in November. And 
they're going to put, even for nonpartisan office, they're going to put people who are uh, registered in their party. And uh, a lot of voters are just going to look at the voter guide and go down the list and vote for people they've never heard of because they're in the voter guide. So that is uh, not as good of an opportunity as a special election or an election that's held any other time except in November of even numbered years. Perfect, Jim. Uh, I, I wanted to add that the, the reason why it's so effective to actually join local boards is because the difference uh, is, is scale. I mean, you're talking about a thousand people voting in some of these smaller municipalities, maybe a couple more thousand versus tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions uh, in some state, in, lar in our large state, right? Uh, and the people who are most uh, active in local government are the same people who have to deal with city or local government all the time. Those uh, sub several, several hundred people basically decide if they know you, if they like you, again, the popularity contest, then they'll just go with it. You, no one, you know, everyone likes you, 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 you don't, you have a, you become a, um, uh, this person who's just a student who's always participating, who cares, uh, that that is key. And I, I, I want to appreciate, I really want to thank everybody for, for attending tonight. Uh, I, I do want, I hope Jim could take a moment and just share his experience of, of, of how he be, he actually ran in one office, elected office himself. Uh, it's, a, it's not too long of a story. Uh, and uh, I'm leave it to <laughs> You just told it. <laughs> you basically just told it. Uh, in 2016, I decided that I was ready to run for office again. I did decades ago as a libertarian in a partisan election and uh, ran for Congress. Like any you know, good libertarian, we want to run for Congress and make a big difference and be the, you know, the new AOC, uh, but for the libertarian side. And of course, uh, I did very well, uh, fortunately, but um, I, I learned that that really wasn't the kind of race that I should run in. So. I was looking for opportunities back in 2016, and I realized uh, that the jurisdiction where I happened to live, the district in my city, had a sitting incumbent who hadn't been opposed in 10 years, and he was getting pretty old himself, and he had no real political abilities, and if he was going to put up much of a fight, he'd have had to have found the money, either in his own bank account or with friends, and put together a campaign by paying for it. And I knew that I would do very well, especially since that particular seat is always going to have an election off year. We have uh, a 32,000 registered voters in my city, but in off years, only about uh, 4,000, maybe 6,000 of them will vote. So that meant that I could probably get the resources of time and money to put up a good fight. Plus, I understand a whole lot from having managed campaigns and been very obviously very involved in politics for decades. So I knew what to do and had the energy. And so that's why I ran. And uh, uh, he took a look at the campaign and freaked out. And to my surprise, the one thing we hadn't planned for was uh, the incumbent would withdraw. So I actually won uh, on the last day of qualifying, my opponent withdrew and uh, no one uh, else knew that or expected that either. So I didn't have a general election. <laughs> and um, so, and that's essentially what happened uh, this past November, a month ago, six weeks ago, we had um, another election. Of course, I'm, I'm run every two years. And I just won my third term and got sworn in a few weeks ago for my third term. Uh, I had an opponent this year, uh, and I was so happy about that because I love competition. And um, I knew I would do well. I have had high confidence that I would win re-election. So I was glad to have an opponent, but uh, they chickened out. And so once again, uh, I won election by... Uh, by my own uh, vote, you could say, that's legally the way they call it. They, there was no balloting. So uh, it's a classic example of what Hector uh, was talking about, where I looked for an opportunity, uh, found an off-year election with a, a, an incumbent sitting there who is a sitting duck. And I took advantage of it. And uh, it's been quite an honor to serve. 
and uh, and so I guess uh, that's one of the main reasons why Hector's story about looking for one of those kind of seats in the 80% of municipal elections where there's no opposition uh, can be a very, very valuable lesson. I am living proof. So thanks for asking the question, Hector. No, no problem. I, I just think every, a lot of people, the job market being the way it is these days, uh, people are actually switching jobs at more than ever before. So my only suggestion is, hey, if, if that's an idea for you, uh, and this is your circ your job circumstances are changing, uh, and you need to move. Uh, you can certainly pick a, a, a location, a locality, a municipality uh, within about you know ha a driving distance, half hour from where you're working at, uh, and and wait it out for that next election. Uh, that's um, you know it doesn't you know if you're gonna if you have to do it anyway, you might as well plan. Just add this to your plan uh, life plan basically. And I, we appreciate the help, uh, Salicia. I wanted to ask a quick question. Um, I'm putting together a library of sorts for fundraising and campaign, how to run a local campaign and things like that here in Duval County. I just kind of wanted to get your y'all's in, input on what you think of that and how, if you think that's valuable or if I'm wasting my time. You should do that. And if uh, leadershipinstitute.com ORG is not on your list of resources, then please put it there. That's a very valuable one. You should also um, use lpaction.org, which is the Libertarian Party's candidate help uh, website that has materials on it. And um, I would recommend that you also get involved, uh, go online with the Florida Institute of Political Leadership, FIPL.org. Org, I believe it is, and they do training across the state that's specifically designed for local elections. Um, there are, of course, some very good books. Um, I won't go into making a list of those right now. Some of them are very inexpensive and easily available on Amazon or whatever. Um, but go to candidate. Go if you go on Facebook. If you have an account, you should have one, even if you don't use it much. And go look on the uh, on Facebook. Search for uh, LPF candidates. LPF candidates. We have a private group, so you have to. Uh, it's. I think you can find it in a search, but it's. Uh, uh, click on there and ask to join. We'll let you in. And um, then you can ask questions like this there and we can be a little more specific and it's shared with other people and, and can talk about, uh, you can share some of your resources that you think are effective. Other people can share theirs. And that's where we help each other to uh, prepare and, and groom ourselves to be professional candidates. If I email you, can you send me some of those other links also? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Try to help any way I can. Candidates at lpf.org. Yeah, that's right. That'll get to me. Well, this has been an absolutely fantastic chat. Larry was very enlightening. And I think even just among ourselves discussing the different strategies and questions that we have, it's been really productive. We've had um, up to 59 people in here, which is really exciting. And I'm going to go ahead and um, credential the ones that I was able to get names on, which was most everybody. And um, I want to remind you one more time about January 30th, the candidates committee is conducting a day of uh, campaign training that day in central Florida. Um, what is the, Jim, do you have the name of the venue, um, an address or yeah. anything like that? Yeah, anybody who, you know, says they're interested to come uh, and we do, we would like to know in advance who's coming so we can, you know, better prepare, uh, make sure we have adequate resources there and so forth. But uh, the name of the place uh, is Wakaiva Island and the name of the building uh, is the, the Michael Barr Building classroom building and it's a very high quality a very well equipped facility and very beautiful and literally built over the top of the scenic Wakaiva River in a very wild section of it so it's a very special location uh, to us for 
for a number of reasons. So that's where we're going to be. There's good food there. There's an open bar. There's a place to hang out and have a good time. And um, it's not that far from the interstate. It's about, uh, uh, I guess, about 10 to 12 minutes drive from Interstate 4. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for coming. It was great to see everyone and have a great evening. All the best. Happy holidays. Stay healthy, everybody. And we'll see you at the ballot box. Yep. Happy thanks, holidays. everybody.